Well, here we go, live for another Thursday lunchtime footy talks. Luke, Stephen, and KJ with you as always. KJ, I really thought Stevie was going to be in a Bundesliga stadium today because obviously <laughs> that is the, the main topic right now. Um, great to see Bundesliga coming back. Uh, we talked a little bit on the new TSN soccer show yesterday about what they've done in terms of preparation to get everybody back and, and how basically they are going to be setting a standard here that a lot of people are going to be looking at. Yeah, we did. It's really great news, let's be honest. First of all, we've all been dying for some kind of live sport. Maybe we'll get into what's going on elsewhere. I spoke to Daniil Henry in Korea last night, and he's about to play a game there, the Canadian as well. So finally, we're starting to see some live sports going on. Some of the countries obviously are far ahead than, than others, but I think the German authorities deserve a lot of credit for the way they've gone about this, to work with government and to get the, you know, the testing right, the, the transport protocols right. And um, let's all take one big sigh of relief and, and collective breath and hope that you know, this is all going forward now that there's no setbacks. Because as you said, some of the other leagues will be watching out what's going on there. Every country and every league is different. It's really no comparables apart from the fact that they're a country and they're trying to get professional soccer started again uh, or football, whatever your preference. But look, it's great you know, to see the fixture list come out again and you see those games being kick, you know, kicking off. Uh, that's what we're all here for. You know, we want to we, we be talking about games again. And uh, it's good that you know, this is a big league in Europe, a monumental league that is finishing the, hopefully finishing the league on the field and not in the boardroom. Stevie, as, a, as an ex-player, I've seen some players, especially some of the lower league players in England, talking about the fact that they, they don't feel it's right to come back, especially if they've got some family members um, who are in a vulnerable position. David Robertson, the former Liverpool player, was talking about how if he was in a locker room right now, um, he wouldn't be feeling comfortable and doesn't want to be forced to do it. Um, how difficult is it, speaking from a former player's point of view, in terms of walking back into that locker room? The expectation is you're going to you're going to play, you're going to play at a very high level, but there's all this other stuff going on. Um, I think difficult, of course, but I think we are tuned in, in sort of program to to think about external stuff. It's a way that we kind of compartmentalise that as, as professional football players. That's that is, is so impressive, I guess. You know, you just put everything, whatever's going on in your personal life, to the back of your mind and you go out there in the field and, and, and you play to the best of your ability. I can see why people are concerned. Uh, if it was me, and I can only speak about me personally, I'd just be be desperate to get back out there. You know, I, I think there's going to be a, a lot of, of safety infrastructure around about these guys going back. So, you know, there'll be plenty of testing and, 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 and screening and, and making sure that if anybody is... Uh, you know, has contracted the, the virus, then obviously they'll be quarantined and, and things like that. So, but I, I can get the, the concern, but I would be desperate to get back out there. The thing that I would be, be most thinking about is, is the kind of the difference of what training and the changing room is going to look like, you know, because there is protocols that some guys are breaking. And, and I, I'm looking at it from a, you know, a totally innocent point of way. I, I think some of them actually have probably broke them by, by accident, I have to say, because I think that it's hard to kind of remember that you can't go up to your teammates and, and have the kind of physical banter that, that we do so often and changing just, them. Just like when you used to break your team curfews by accident late at night. <laughs> when you by accident weren't in bed when you should have been and that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, my, my thing with breaking curfews was always, well, if we all do it, what's going to happen? We can, can, can't really like drop the lot of us. So I was always a ringleader when it came to that, KJ. But I think that, you know, we don't want to see players breaking, breaking the rules and, and obviously having any kind of contact. But I, I do think that sometimes just naively they forget. And so that would be a concern of mine if I was a player thinking about, you know, uh, doing things properly, doing things right, so that the safety of everybody is is, is paramount, of course. Uh, Taylor Twelman is the first guest up on uh, Footy Talks this Thursday lunchtime, a voice that you will have uh, heard and seen, uh, obviously with TSN broadcasting lots of Major League Soccer games. We get the opportunity to hear from Taylor uh, pretty much every weekend. Taylor, when MLS, we, we talked a lot about MLS and other leagues the last few weeks, about how people are going to survive right now and and uh, clubs in England struggling, especially down the lower leagues and, and the overspending. 
Um, and we've, we've talked a little bit about the fact that maybe MLS, of all the leagues in the world, isn't in such a bad position in terms of where they are in the central contracts, the, the yep. salary cap, some of the things that maybe in the past people have said have worked against MLS. Do you agree that maybe now Major League Soccer can come out of this stronger and more of a player in the global market? Absolutely. Absolutely. I said it this week in Forbes magazine. That's a, listen, I, I'm not sitting here going to say that no one's losing money in Major League Soccer. They are. I, we've seen Adrian Hanauer from Seattle say it could be upwards to a billion dollars. I understand all of that, but single entity really works in their favor right now. You guys said it at the beginning of the show. Barcelona's lost over $100 million in revenue just in one quarter, but they don't have the luxury of carrying each other. Now, all four of us would agree it's not going to be every MLS owner, right? There's going to be two or three MLS owners that are going to have to try to – they're going to have to be a little bit more pragmatic in how they reassess this. It actually wouldn't surprise me if one or two clubs maybe goes up for sale. Um, I doubt that happens. But my word, you could have six or seven MLS franchises that look at this and say, listen, we could buy players 60 cents to a dollar right now and get players that we would have never had that ability or just loan them. Just get players on loan and see what that can do. I think there's a real opportunity, Luke. I absolutely do. I hope MLS teams realize it. Uh, but what I'm hearing in the Board of Governors is there is there, there's a kind of segregation of owners that one are looking at it saying, no, let, let's do this. Let's roll up our sleeves, put our head down. And then obviously there's some other owners where, and it, listen, you lose 85% of your revenue because you're not playing with fans. I get it. it, it you're taking a hit. Taylor, let me ask you this about soccer right now in terms of the media in the United States. You know, part of this show, what we do in Canada, we, you know, we have a show here on TSN and we've got shows mm -hmm. going here. We're trying to just get the game talked about as much as possible. You talk about that Forbes magazine. You know, you've got your great show there. You've got the massive personality on ESPN. You've got an infectious personality. It's a lot to take up with what you bring to the game. What a lot of things that I admire about you. What's it like right now in that battle? Because it is still a bit of a battle. You know, are you oh, yeah. having those conversations with – bosses at the ESPN to try and get on first off or how's those things going on how are we keeping this soccer sport going on in terms of trending during this time how tough is that for you KJ it's a great question I think it's one of those where you guys know this in Toronto Maple Leafs are first Raptors are second TFC fighting in there uh, that's kind of a microcosm of what the United States is maybe a little bit different in the sense that the NFL is so massive and then college football they're almost their own section mm. of media mm. What's very interesting is that our new president, Jimmy Pataro, is young. Um, he understands the potential of what Major League Soccer and soccer can do. He's rolled up his sleeves and gotten very engaged with Don Garber and, and, and that board of governors to try to bring MLS back, which internally is a massive sign for us. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm, you guys know me. I'm not a company man, but I'm going to say a company line here. If ESPN is engaged, 20, 30, 40% extra viewers are going to come. It just, it's fact. Um, and we need that. Now, getting on our main shows, Get Up, um, Sports Center. I've done more Sports Center in the last 24 months than I did in the previous seven years. That includes two World Cups. I've done Scott Van Pelt, which never happened. And he, he and I have had a relationship. You have to get dressed. Yeah. <laughs> it all in your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part. The, the best part about having a studio in your house is no one really knows, but it leads to your imagination. One of these times, I should just get suspended and stand up and see what happens. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. Um, KJ, it's interesting. It's just you're fighting for it. But our digital show this year, granted, we launched it during the pandemic, but the last show we did – Right before all the studios closed, we did over a million views. Wow. That tells me, has nothing to do with me, nothing. It tells me there's an appetite for treating American soccer the way we treat all other entities. And if you do it right, it's raised some eyebrows. Now, obviously, the pandemic and all of that changes everything, but it was right around late March. The numbers came back, and I got a lot of emails saying, what? wait a minute, like, hold on here. That's my whole goal in this. You guys, we've had beers. We, we've hung out. That's my whole goal in this is just to say, you know what? We're no different, so don't treat us different, even though we have for the last 30 years. I think we've made progress, but until we're on primetime television, that's, that's when I'm going to say, yeah, we've made it. And I hope we get there. Um, I hope MLS owners are open to new ideas 
Because if we can get on primetime television in the United States on ESPN at 8, 9 o'clock Eastern, the way we did for LALA playoff game, then the numbers are going to be there. They just are. Quentin Westberg is in the conversation with us uh, for this Footy Talks uh, on torontofc.ca tomorrow night. It is the game of the week, which is TFC against DC United in the playoffs last year. Of course, that one-off game at uh, BMO Field, win or go home. And TFC, um, it was tight for a while. TFC in the lead till just before the end. And then, of course, it went to extra time. Uh, Quentin Westberg, TFC goalkeeper, with us to talk a little bit about that one. Taylor Twelman, we just had on, is very good at telling stories. And so is this man that's joining the conversation now, Quentin Westberg, who uh, is TFC goalkeeper, had some fascinating conversations in the media room at, at uh, the training ground there uh, just after you arrived and you, you told us all about your story of how you got to Toronto, um, a little bit about your background. So it's great to have you join us uh, today. First off, though, how are you and your family doing right now? Hello, gentlemen. Uh, it's, nice to, it's nice to have me. Everyone, uh, luckily, is doing fine. You know, uh, obviously, we get a lot of time together, uh, a lot. So we're happy. And it's also, you know, it's not as maybe calm as it would be... Uh, just for a couple or uh, a couple with one kid, you know, we, we have three uh, expecting a fourth. So days are, are pretty busy, but uh, enjoying a lot of family time for sure. When's number four on the way? Uh, soon, soon. Uh, uh, due date is in a month. So wow. it could happen almost uh, anytime soon. Well, good luck with that because I've got three and I'm, I'm out. Um, <laughs> we said that after one, by the way, just to, just to let everyone know. <laughs> that is true. I've been hearing a lot of that, you know. <laughs> Somehow we're in this mess. Um, Henry says uh, on the chat, your, your hair still looks good. So have you got somebody doing that or are you? It's my, my wife is exceptional at a lot of things and she just like, she can reinvent herself in, in a barber. So we just manage, you know, it's. Yeah, I'm kind of happy I'm still on, on just a Zoom session, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw a few weeks ago, and we've seen lots of different footballers around the world doing different things in their yard at home, in their, in their gardens, just trying to keep going and, and various different things. Claudio Bravo um, was hammering the ball against the wall and then chasing it backwards to try and tip it over his goal that he's got in the garden. Uh, is it more difficult for a goalkeeper to try and, I mean, there's not a lot, a great deal you can do in, at home, is there? No, there's not a lot. I don't think you can be creative. You can, I think, you know, my, my mindset right now is just to be ready physically to, to, to get back in goal and, uh, and just, uh, and just be solely focused on just my handling and just, you know, the eyeball uh, coordination, all of that, because I think if you try and do too much, it, it, I would get, or if I would, I would get really frustrated because it, it it's nothing compared to what I like and the, the actual ball feeling and the sensations that I want to get. So to avoid the frustration, I'm just at peace with, you know, uh, working a, a decent amount physically, being ready to, to, to just uh, get on and get a good load of uh, goalkeeping as soon as we can. I saw, Wait, so let me, go ahead, Stevie. I was just going to say, I saw Joe Bendick, uh, obviously ex-TFC and teammate of mine, now with the Philadelphia Union. He, he had some space, I guess. He's, he has a luxury of space and, in Philadelphia, the outskirts where he stays, and he has one of the ball machines, and it's firing balls at him, and he's he's tipping it around. And I almost text him because a few of them were getting past him. I was like, "You're looking a bit <laughs> sluggish there, Joe. You need to get uh, get practicing, mate." But uh, yeah, that's the difficulty living in a city like Toronto or New York or you know some of the cities. You don't have the space, and goalkeepers are probably the most affected by that. We're not being able to get the handling that's needed. Quinton, before we get to the game that we talk about this week and, and your time with Toronto on the field, maybe you can share with some of our viewers on Facebook and here live on Zoom about how you talk about your family there. You're going to bring somebody in, uh, you know, into, into Canada, born in Canada, maybe a future Canadian international you're going to bring in there maybe in a month or <laughs> us. But how's your time in Canada as a family? How much have you enjoyed it? Because I know, I know you haven't been here that long, but I'm sure you enjoyed the time here. It's been great and it's been a, a great fit. You know, uh, obviously making a decision to move a family uh, with quite some numbers is a, is a, different, um, is a different, different decision to make and it's filled with responsibilities and I take it uh, really seriously. So, of course, we looked in uh, as soon as the Toronto opportunity um, came around the corner, then we, we looked into it quite a lot because um, I can't just think for myself now, you know, as much as I, I knew right from the start, the club was a great place. I needed to know where we would land and uh, 
how Canada was and where we could school them and, you know, took it very seriously. And um, I can say that I'm really, really happy with that decision and, and having a, a fourth uh, child and here is, is a big statement. And you I think signed, you signed a new contract as well, just back in January, Quentin. So you're planning on staying here for a little while. As I said, you know, we're, we're in a business and it's an industry, but um, as I said in January and as, and as I have felt all along, uh, there's nowhere else right now that I would rather be. Uh, just uh, the atmosphere um, at the club is, is outstanding. I feel uh, we understand very well. Uh, people understand me there and I understand people there. So there's a, just a, a work relationship that's, that's amazing and, uh, and also off the field we feel really comfortable in the city uh just in um in our day-to-day -day lives so you know I, I i like to think i don't have uh very very high expectations but as long as my family is happy and and the soccer part is going well then uh it's just a it's just a perfect fit you're you're very much a, a player's player quentin i think you're a you know a, a great teammate obviously i've I've not spent great amounts of time with you, but I had the pleasure of speaking to you. How difficult was it for you when you first came to Toronto, being patient, waiting on your uh, your opportunity to get that position? I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to be number one, but I, I often think about goalkeepers and how much more difficult it is for them when they are an understudy because it, it does feel like they're further away from the field. Was, was that a challenge for you in... What do you do, basically, to try and keep that number one jersey when you get in there? It's, uh, it's a very good question because it's something I have strugg struggled with earlier in my career. You know, the frustration, the day-to-day -day work, the, I was better than him today, I was better than the starter, and still keeping a, a, just a, a clear mind, you know, and being able to move forward. And until I was 23, 24, I didn't manage, manage it really well with myself. I, I, was, I, I like to think I was always... a someone that cared about my team and about uh, the, the burden that I was or not for a team. And I, I, I value it greatly. So I know it wasn't much of a burden throughout my career. It's just that this psychological impact that it has on you, just working and not playing. And when, when I turned 26, 27, I've had all kinds of different experiences in, in that same year that have taught me a, a lot. And, um, I just, uh, I just believe in, in myself and mostly I'm very at peace with my identity, both on and off the field, you know, and it's around that time that I really established myself as a man and as a player, knowing my strengths and my weaknesses also, what I did well and what has, um, what has benefited me in, in the past. And I was able to kind of mix everything up and just know that with time, I, I will get my chance. And when I get my chance, I know how to handle a few games and then how to establish yourself, how you need to look, you know, because if your mentality is the exact same when you play your first games and after 15 or 20, then there's no improvement. There's no evolution, you know, and it's also what you bring to a team. It's that balance. And it's really passion. I mean, it, it brings a lot of passion in me to, to think that there's a lot more than the, than the soccer field to, to being a professional. And, especially as being a goalkeeper you know there's there's a lot more and there's what you bring to the team and when you have a strong personality or you all when you like your sport you have a you have an opinion on everything but sometimes it's just not wise to say what you think right from the start it's just to kind of prove what you think and then trying to establish yourself like this and I think there's a whole construction I could go on and talk hours about it but I think in a locker room there's a balance between who you are and what your teammates see you like. And as it goes, how can you have an influence and a positive influence for that matter without, you know, just taking all the light? I think that's really well eloquently put. And I, I, I can tell listening to, and I've heard that story before, why it's so infectious for some of the players that play with you because they learn so much. And I think that's what makes you one of the most intelligent signings TFC have made in some years, actually, uh, because you, you fit the model of that dressing room really well in terms of you came over to a group, didn't you, that was already quite experienced in big games as well. And then that, that coolness that you bring in those areas. And I wanted to ask you about that because obviously we're linking towards the game that was on uh, the, the DC game. But when DC scored that goal and it was at 1-1, I remember doing the sideline report broadcast reporting and Stephen and Luke were doing the match and there didn't seem to be any kind of you know 
people losing their calm on the sideline. You were seconds away from winning a playoff game and then you can have to go back and play another 30 minute match. I think one of the biggest things I could describe TFC over the last two or three years, which in their development to be a top team has been how strong they are against adversity. You know, they really, and when did you notice that Quinton? And maybe you can take us into that in terms of noticing a team that was really strong mentally when you arrived and what it was like to go on in that match when it was 1-1 after 90 minutes. Turning point was the Montreal game in Montreal in July with the full squad with, okay, our back, backs against the wall, you know, basically knowing that we had to go on a good streak to make the playoffs because at some point making the playoffs was an objective. You know, making the playoffs would have been a positive season and we were able to turn that positive streak into a, a home game advantage. I think we need to consider that the Columbus game was a very, very important game because um, it was decision day. We were sixth at the time, ended up being fourth and having a home field game. And that, un until you live a playoff game uh, at BMO Field, you only hear about it. You know, for myself, for Ale Pozuelo, for Nick De Leon, for Richie, we've heard about the BMO Knights, we've heard about, and obviously that's what's made this club great, you know, and To be honest, we wanted to live it in a way, you know, and we put ourselves in a very steady, slow, but very confident way. We lean toward that possibility. And even towards decision day, it was still far away, but still manageable. And when it did happen, we knew we were, we could handle what was going to come next, given the experience of the core group of guys that had lived so much together and the... Um, I would say the freshness of the newcomers, you know, we were able to, um, I think, do a great mix of all of that and actually enjoy that night and leading to that goal we take in the last minute. I think this it's the perfect moment where the freshness of the new guys and the experience of the older guys just popped in. And at that moment, I think it took us like, what, 10 minutes to score four goals. And I think it's, it's something you cannot explain. You cannot teach it. You cannot, and the experience of the staff also, you need to give them credit for that. Okay, it was a setback, but it didn't feel like we were going to crumble. And it took us, what, two minutes to score a first goal. And after five, we were leading 3-1 and 7-4-1. And I think almost that this scenario gave us an opportunity to share even more with, with the city, knowing it was going to be our only playoff game at home. And I think it, it, it was a particular scenario, but it gave us the opportunity to really get one of these BMO night feelings, you know? It, it almost worked out better than just winning the game 1-0. Like, you, people left BMO field feeling better than they would have after what happened than if you just won the game 1-0. Um, Henry says, Wayne Rooney still has nightmares about that game. Miles says he just got a chill when you mentioned big playoff nights at BMO. Uh, producer Kevin has a couple of your saves, I think, lined up from that night. So we can, we can just take a, a look at some of those saves because it was, it was quite a night. Um, and you were called into action two or three times, especially to try and stop Wayne Rooney. Uh, so he might just be able to roll those on. I'll see uh, that one, of, obviously, is uh, Bill Hamid. But here we go. And let's see what we've got lined up here. Have you got a favorite from this night? Favorite save? Yeah, well, as much and as yeah, as much as I respect Wayne Rooney and I, I really, really love the player and the guy, just for what he's done all over for soccer, it's it's my save against Ule Kamara that uh, I, I I liked the most during that night. Uh, I think the fact that I had a few in a row with Wayne Rooney uh, made it a little particular from the outside. But you know, once you're on the field, I I barely notice who's taking you know who's striking the ball until it's in my hands you know or un until it's gone so he has the Ule camera save uh was one that i that i really liked just because um and we've talked about it with uh, with christian uh, earlier this uh, this year but i think i made a, a brilliant decision earlier to give me a chance to actually make a save and not react under emotion under the under the consequences of, yes, it was a special night. Yes, it's a playoff game. It's a make or break. And uh, right on, on, on this one, and instead of going out and challenging the ball and maybe doing something stupid to get a red card or get dribbled past, I just put myself in a situation where I was confident with my abilities and, okay, it's a 1v1 and maybe the forward has the edge at first. And I think he was surprised also with that decision. 
and at the moment when he struck the ball, it, it feels like he kind of rush, rush, rushes it when really he had all the time, not all the time in the world, but if you ask him before the game, uh, you will have a 1v1 like this against this keeper. He, he would take it any day, of the, any day of the week. So, yes, it's, it's more the, the mental part in all of that that, that, I, that I'm happy with. And, and, of course, the moment and being able to, to be there for my team is, is always... Uh, it's always a great moment, but this save in particular is, is the one that I, that I remember from that night. I, I think you do an interesting thing here. I, I think you give him more time, which, which I think makes him, makes him nervous and makes him panic. And, and so the question I want to ask, I watch you guys train. I mean, we're obviously close defenders and goalkeepers, but we never get each other entirely. And you guys are all about repetition. He's do the same drills all the time. So when it comes to the moments that the Rooney save where it's point blank range and Kamara bearing down in your goal, is it that repetition that, that almost puts you into overdrive and, and, and makes you very instinctual or do you, do you fall back on your, your technique and your, your footwork, your movement? I, I always wonder that. Is it a subconscious that, that makes the decisions or do you feel very cerebral at that moment? Uh, I think it's a great question because I think every goalkeeper is different, you know, in, in, in some situations and especially as you're younger or maybe less experienced or maybe more emotional, sometimes you kind of want a, a, a 50-50 or a duel to be over with. So basically you choose a side and either you get lucky or not, you know, and I kind of fight repetition. I think repetition is like, um, is like a routine for a pianist. You do it to feel good, but then in a game, it's the exact opposite. I don't, dive or choose because on the Friday prior to the game, I dove 10 times to the right and seven to the left. It's exactly it. it. The repetition is just a way to get warmed up. But then my mind and my instinct does the difference, does the rest. It's I'm going to stay as long as possible on my feet. Then he's on his left, left foot. What is happening? You know, you can analyze and it's just seeing so many situations. It gives you that, that instinct to either stay or dive one way and, I mean, there it was instinct and staying on my feet as long as possible. And on the penalty kick against Atlanta, I was more like almost guessing after a certain pattern. So I think it's bringing everything inside, taking everything that you think is going to be useful, but then using it in so many different ways throughout a game, throughout a season. And this is what I like about my position is you can work as much as you want. You never can expect what's going to happen in a game. And sometimes the easiest ball turn out into a be, a being a horrible goal conceded. And sometimes the hardest balls or even the hardest situations to read. It's just you manage. You always adapt. You know, and the, the greatest thing I've learned from Fabian Barthez is he was, he was quite a character. And he had just this one thing he would always say is, as goalkeepers, we need to adapt, adapt, always adapt. You know, if you expect the one game against DC to be the exact same as the next game against NYCFC already, you're not prepared. That's, that's what I think. And I think it's just the fruit of a lot of learning, a lot of watching. And then, as I said, being at peace with my identity also, knowing my strengths and being able to showcase them in the best way possible. Do I have another question about that mentally? Uh, you talk about the peace there. What I like to ask about goalkeepers is that, you know, there's, there's moments in a game where it all goes off, it ignites. And a lot of those moments are obviously followed up by your biggest moment and maybe a big free kick where a player's got sent off and you have to set up a wall or like the moment in Atlanta where there's a penalty and the players are surrounding the referee and you know that referee's not changing his mind. What do you do then to get ready mentally when the whole crowd is at its loudest and the players are all going crazy and they're all arguing and telling each other what's going on and you have to find that inner peace. Talk us through that moment and the background that you have to think about to get ready for that one-on-one -on -one duel, whether it be a free kick or setting up for a penalty. That fascinates me for goalkeepers. It's, it's, to be honest, it's the best moment. It's the, the moment where you're in front of 40, 50,000 people, but you, you hardly realize you're at that moment because you're so cold. This is what I need. And thanks to experience, time, and also... A lot of uh, failures also, you know, knowing sometimes being too emotional in a game, you know, it, it, I know it doesn't, it doesn't fit me well. So with time, I, I, I've learned to, to know in which circumstances I feel the best. And I know that for myself, the, the, the bigger game for me is just being managing 
the anxiety and also the, the desire and the determination before to step onto the pitch and be totally calm, totally cool, totally cold, you know? Because I know that if I don't feel the anxiety and the determina determination before a game, I don't have this concentration that is my focus, that is my security in a way. And I'm sure defenders, it's, it's almost a little bit the same. You know, you can, you can have a perfect game and do one mistake and everybody's going to remember the mistake, but that's part of it also. That's part of the thrill. That's why what is hard for goalkeepers or for myself is to enjoy a good performance on the moment because you already have to focus on next, knowing that it's still going to determine how your season went and this and that. So you can never really be satisfied with yourself. You can enjoy a moment, but the next day it's, it's already gone, gone. It's already done. Plus with the playoff format, there's only, to my mind, one goalkeeper that can be happy at the end of a season, only one. And this is what gets you going also. This is the addiction, you know, and this is what I've learned to really cherish and be grateful for is when you're on the field, you, you cannot neglect these moments, but also you, net, you cannot be caught into them and not, you know, when you play a good game, it's easy to, to, to spend the next three or four days just, you know, reminiscing and just enjoying it. But you're putting to waste three or four days. And this is, the, this is not the trick because I'm sure some keepers are maybe doing it and enjoying it and doing very well. But for, my, for myself, I know that I'm never really 100% satisfied, you know? And that's the, that's the ambivalent part is, yes, you can be happy, but something next is coming and you're exposed again. So you never know what happens. Then that's, yes, once again, it's the thrill and the addiction. And being able to be calm is my, is my way of having my level of focus and my technique ready at the, the premium level. We're running out of time on the show, but we've got a, a couple of questions just before we go that I want to get to from uh, people who've, um, who've written in on the chat, um, including Edda, who asks, uh, who was your goalkeeping idol growing up? And then another one to say, when did you decide you want to be a goalkeeper? Is it one of those stories like, I was always a striker scoring lots of goals. Then somebody was hurt and I had to go in goal and I stayed there ever since. What, what's your story about yes, that? And who, it's who was that. your goalkeeper you looked up to? So uh, I was, I've always, I was a forward the first, the, the first, uh, at first when I started to be a, uh, started to play soccer, but I've, I always wanted to play, always, always wanted to play. And the older guys uh, were playing when maybe guys my age weren't and all they needed was a keeper basically because no one wanted, no one wanted to go in goal. So, I would be a striker with my age group and just with the older guys in the street or, or, or anywhere at school, I would go in goal just to play, to keep playing, to keep playing. And when I went back to club soccer the, the year after, uh, some friends that had seen me in goal told me, oh, he can be a goal, he, he's good. And I kind of liked it. So I would only be a goalkeeper in the club structure, in a defined structure with the coach and this and that. If we play a pickup game, anything else, I will never be in goal, never, ever. Because to me, goalkeeping is... It's sort of sacred, you know, and I like to play too much to, to not take seriously the fact that I'm in goal. And for my goalkeeping idols, I grew up being a PSG fan, growing up in a Paris area. So Bernard Lama was my idol growing up. But soon enough, I realized I was the exact opposite in style. <laughs> so I looked up to him, but didn't take anything from him, basically, because he was almost a cat and I was the exact opposite. So then I looked up a lot to Fabian Barthez, obviously, and all these more playing style, you know, comfortable with their feet. Barthez was like a pioneer in his way. He was very, very, very good with his feet. You know, he had a playing sense. You know, he would always want to play. And the one thing that brought us together, you know, I was, I was uh, lucky enough to have him as the general manager at some point in my career. But all the exchange we were able to have is we have a lot of similarities on, on the way we see the position and on the way we see the game. So that was, that, that was a blessing also. And I know from watching your Instagram a lot that, you, that the Clairefontaine boys always stick together. Wow, Clairefontaine is, and now more than ever, you know, it's, uh, I think I was, uh, I was really fortunate and this definitely set um, uh, the identity uh, that I have as a man and, and as a player and all the values that I, that I learned there on and off the field are, are, are values that I'm very, very proud to carry. To carry. And um, you, you really, like, I was, we were on the phone for five hours yesterday, uh, just a, a group of us. And yes, we have a very, very tight knit and um, a tight group. And we've, ex we've uh, had so many experiences in common and we basically grew 
grew up as men together and as at soccer players that yes there's something just like a, a a family link you know between us well let me know how you managed to uh, with three kids chat on the phone with your friends for five hours because i'd love to i'd love to know how you managed to pull out oh, we all know who's unhappy in that story but <laughs> <laughs> listen it's been great to, to catch up with you thanks for spending the time with the tfc fans here on zoom and on, on facebook live on footy talks this lunchtime some fabulous insight and hopefully it isn't uh, all that long until you can get back to training and, uh, and back out on the pitch as well. All the best for you and your family, Q. Thanks, Quinn, and be well. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Um, well, we better wrap it up because Stevie's got to go climb back up still in Castle or whatever it is there. Um, <laughs> great show once again. Uh, Thursday lunchtimes, 12.30, footy talks. Uh, we'll try and get a couple of great guests on next week as well. Thanks to Taylor Twelman. Thanks to Quentin Westberg and thanks to everybody wherever Thank you are you, for tuning in today around Sorry. the world uh, to Footy Talks. We'll see you again next week.